All right, everyone, thank you. Um, if we can get your attention. So um, a lot of you probably know that about 30% of the businesses in cannabis are owned or operated by women, which is a huge number compared to more traditional industries. Um, we're really excited to have uh, Treehouse Ventures here with us today. And Treehouse Ventures um, is a woman-owned company that does invest in women-owned businesses. What we were finding with a lot of female-owned businesses is they weren't really getting access to capital the way male-owned businesses were. And that's not even just cannabis, of course. That's, that's actually across just about any industry. And so it's great that we've gotten women to, you know, step up and help out um, our fellow sisters. So uh, leading us today is uh, Lori Ferrara. Now, Lori is, as we like to say, a baller. She uh, managed syndicate um, operations at MediaTek for some of TV's biggest titles, um, Inside Edition, Jeopardy, Geraldo, Oprah Winfrey, so really big stuff. She began researching medical cannabis while she nursed her husband through a battle with cancer. Um, and then once that got her into it, she, you know, was really a part of cannabis's um, early development. She knew it would need experienced leadership and entrepreneurs, and that's really when she became um, the first female investor member of the ArcView group. A lot of you know ArcView for uh, their research reports or uh, some of their investor events that they do. And uh, now her latest creation is Treehouse Global Ventures, and as I mentioned it's a fund that helps uh, female businesses uh, get started. So I am going to now turn this over to Lori. Great, thank you ladies. Let's start off with an easy question. What makes the cannabis industry a distinctive investment? Why is it exciting to invest in the cannabis industry? Go for it. <laughs> wow, that's such a, a huge question. For me, it's exciting to create new products and to really craft the future of the health and wellness for the US and internationally as well. So, and every day is different. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, when you look at cannabis, it's, it's already on to its next iteration or maybe even some people call it cannabis, we're approaching cannabis 3.0, where um, you know, it was a, a pretty disjointed or entity and industry five years ago, and then it went through this first wave of creating all these companies. Now I think, I, I laugh that there are so many brands in the space. I used to be able to count them on one hand, and you could say, I'm sure you had this experience where you knew every single company that was operating cannabis across the country, and now there are so many that every time I hear of a new one, I just kind of roll my eyes, and I'm like, of course there's another one. Um, so I think the acceleration of the industry is really interesting, and it, and it pulls on so many different industries. I mean, I think it's a combination of pharma, CPG, uh, you know, alcohol. Uh, there are just so many different things that apply to it because of the areas that it can impact. So I think that's why it's so interesting is that it, I feel like it keeps kind of changing its, its face a little bit, which keeps us all on our toes. Great. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. There, I mean, in the beginning, there was one vape company, maybe Open Vape, right? <laughs> now there's probably 50. Okay, what have you experienced over the last year or two that has evolved or changed in the cannabis investments, in cannabis investments? Um, I think for me, it's, it's the way that we look at investments. There, there was a period in time where you got a PowerPoint de deck and a charismatic entrepreneur, and that was all it took. Um, and everybody was wrong. Uh, and now we have comps. You know, we have actual businesses that have been in operation for anywhere from five to 10 years, which is, is it's amazing that those businesses have even survived that long because the industry has changed so much. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting way that when you're looking at investments now, the thesis has changed, the structure of looking at investments has changed, um, and has become, I think, a little bit more sophisticated, but at the same time, we're still kind of making it up, I think, as we go along, because we're not totally sure uh, what stage this is. Like, with all these companies going public right now, we're not sure if that's something that's going to last a while or if this is truly a bubble that is going to burst. And I think there are a lot of different theories around that. I won't share mine. But um, I think that's the evolution of the way you look at investments has been big. And for me, I think a lot of the suits have arrived, along with the family offices are definitely getting in the space now. Um, okay, What are the key characteristics of a female-owned and operated business opportunity that gets you make that gets you to make an investment. What gets you to say yes? Me? I mean, if I can, if I because I'm constantly reviewing 
M and A at, at Canacraft, and I I don't know that it has anything to do with really gender lines. I think it's about if you have a great idea that's innovation forward, that's forward leaning, um, and you have a really good business plan, and you have a route to market, that's what you need. It doesn't matter what gender you are. Um, at least that's not what I'm seeing, and and I don't think there's any lack of female entrepreneurs in, entering the business with great ideas. It's just a matter of finding that seed funding, I think is the biggest challenge for, for females in that space. For me, it's also the uh, brain trust of the advisory board and happy to say to hear it is on our advisory board and we're excited about that. Um, Tracy, as a follow-up, have you found any exciting female-focused brands seeking a partnership in Canacraft? Actually, I have. And what's really interesting now is with the space that we're in, you know, I think there's two companies that are sort of emerging in the space. One is, you know, people who are emerging as that it's a money grab. They just want to somehow turn and burn whatever it is that they're doing. And then there's other companies that are entering the space with a real passion for the plant. And and not only as it relates to to CBD products or products that are derived from cannabis, but also those that are derived from hemp. And so what's been most telling, what's interesting is that there seems to be a little gender line distinction, at least in what I'm seeing coming across my desk. And Women-led businesses are, playing, are, are leaning heavily against their experience, and those experiences could be in, in wine and spirits like mine have been, or in, in beauty and wellness, which you know, we're seeing a lot of really beautiful uh, beauty and wellness brands that are highly innovative with new technologies around absorption that are super exciting. Um, and so th I, I think that's, that's part of it as well. Um, and, uh, and so, it feels as though it's leaning towards women are, are, are marching more towards CBD and wellness. Um, and that I am painting with the biggest, widest brush ever. I recognize that. But um, what's been most exciting for me personally has been people who are really thinking forward and leaning into that space with a, a real mind toward uh, therapeutic solutions to everyday real problems that are plaguing Americans like depression and weight gain and, and uh, anxiety. So it's, uh, it's really exciting to see natural product take the place of, of other drugs that this, com that this country is addicted to. I couldn't agree more. So here, are lots of investors made money in the first wave of cannabis valuations. Where do you see the next wave of opportunity for female-led companies? I mean, I'm, I'm still not convinced that the best brands that are going to exist in 10 years have necessarily been created yet or are in their current form are the ones that are going to be, you know, the, the big, you know, I hate saying it like the Starbucks or the Coke or whatever, but thinking that, right, we're still really early. And for anybody who has been in the brand building business, it takes a really long time to build a brand, to create value in that, to create, um, you know, consistent consumers. Um, so you probably know way more about this than I do because of your brand experience. But, you know, it takes a while to get there. And, and right now there's just such a frenzy that people are like, we're a billion dollar brand because we have you know, 50,000 Instagram followers. And I'm like, that means nothing because that doesn't actually turn into revenue. And so the metrics that we're using to measure these things I don't think are actually accurate. And I think the next wave is really who are the ones who are going to be actually able to stand the test of time because we've, we're still in a little bit of this area where you can get these crazy valuations and not totally different from tech. You don't have to be profitable. You can have like you know negative EBITDA and still be at this crazy valuation. But does that actually turn into a business that has longevity? I don't think we know that yet. And so I think those that's kind of the next wave of these is growth stage companies that can actually really you know, have strong infrastructure and be able to become profitable over time. And hopefully an acquisition target. Yeah, or a standalone company. I mean, everybody's so focused on getting acquired or, or having that as their exit. But what about the companies that just want to operate and, and be companies? Like, there is a real, there's room for that. And there exactly. should, I think that that's the wrong way to look at it is everybody's now looking at, like, what's our exit opportunity? Um, and that scares me a little bit, too, because you're just, I think, building to sell. Um, and that's not sustainable either. Right. So the Farm Bill passed on December 20th of last year. And it was a pretty quiet January, but something happened in the industry in February, and the hemp industry just exploded overnight. Um, where I'd have one or two entrepreneurs a week emailing me, it, I don't know, grew by a, a factor of 10. Um, I'm seeing tremendous growth in hemp-derived CBD products. Um, it's being led primarily, yes, by women, because 
women make 80% of the health and wellness choices for their families in the US, and they are formulating products made of hemp CBD to answer the needs of their families. Um, whether it's a sick child, an ailing parent, all of that is being addressed. I do think that there will be a CBD bubble um, once we get towards national legalization of THC marijuana, we will go back to, and in my opinion, a one-to-one -one ratio or play with these different ratios of cannabinoids in different products. And at that point, I think that a ratio of CBD to THC will become a more relevant product sector. And then after that, hemp is a form of cannabis. I am seeing amazing opportunities for investment with a very quick turnaround on ROI in things like hemp food, hemp cooking oil, and then a little longer down the investment um, train, I would say bioplastics and graphite batteries made of hemp will be a huge economic driver for the US economy. I would just, I totally agree with that. that I think industrial hemp is something that's like very much overlooked right now because it's, it's a long-term play. There's a lot of R&D, it's expensive. Uh, but it's massive when you think about the sustainability elements and all the things that we're dealing with right now when it comes to waste. Um, that could be a really interesting market, but it's for the investors who are interested and in not the, the quick turn because it's not happening right now. What are some of the benefits investors can expect in investing in women-led cannabis companies? Well, I mean, that stat that I gave you early, earlier 80% of all the health and wellness choices are made by women in the US. 85% of all the medical choices are made by women in families in the US. So having a, a woman in the CEO position or quite anything, I have been a marketer almost all of my THC career. Let me make it really clear. But having a woman in any C-level position other than marketing will impact your profitability and return on investment. Ditto. Yeah. Ditto. I agree. Yeah. It's just statistically proven is that the more women that are in C-level suites, the more profitable companies. There's a direct correlation in the cannabis is any different. I think there's also just diversity of thought, too, because a lot of the, you know, you, you tend to find teams now that are often from the same background because people have been pulling on their own networks, which is a logical thing to do, but then you, you do often get into group think, and I think we see that in a lot of different industries. It's, it's not anything new for cannabis. It's new for cannabis itself, but it's not new for industry, uh, you know, different industries as a whole, and I think that that is really important, important. and we, you know, not just women, but other uh, ethnic groups and kind of uh, socioeconomic backgrounds like that all contributes to how you think about bringing a product to market or running a business or uh, managing your team and all of those aspects are really important. So, you know, f female, it's like tip of the iceberg for me where it's like, yes, that is a huge, huge game changer, but there are all these other elements too that certainly add to it. Yeah, and I think we're just addressing it head on and if we can have just the same access that everybody else, um, we're going to do really great. Did you have a follow-up to that? I did, so I'm a late addition to the panel. Um, I Googled this last night. It's called the gender profit premium. When a minimum of 30% of women are represented in the C-suite level, profitability jumps between 6 and 15%. And you can look it up. It's the Peterson Inter Institute for International Economics. And there are a multitude of other studies as well. And then, of course, there's one or two studies that have you know, dispute that completely, <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see, what can women-led brands do to stand out more to organizations such as Canacraft? Tracy? That was a, that was a <laughs> Tracy staged question. question. Um, so what can women-led? Yeah, how can women-led companies become more visible and have more of an impact with organizations like yours? Well, I mean, it's like I said, again, I struggle with the women-led thing because I, I, I do, you know, other than the sector in which I see the majority of women playing, um, I don't know, again, if you have a great brand and a great passion and great commitment to the brand. I do think 
you know, women, again, painting with a broad brush, but women's approach to business uh, might be a little bit more pragmatic, a little bit more inclusive um, than our, our male counterparts. And I think both of those things are necessary in, in, in business. And you know, having been the only female in a sweet suite so for a lot, really long time in the alcohol business, I can say that cannabis is different um, and better in that regard. But um, as it relates to just specifically being a female-led business, I mean, you need to have the right people on your team. You need to have compelling people, smart people that, that are, are going to drive your business forward and make things happen. And, and uh, I mean, I think whether you're male or female, that's, that's necessary. I agree. Christy, I know we touched on hemp, but would you talk a little bit more about the opportunity in hemp? I made a list. <laughs> so I'll just walk you through it. So basically, let's start from the ground up. Um, the carpet that's under your feet can be made from hemp. The plastic chair with the leatherette covering, all of that can be made from hemp. The water bottle in front of you the battery in your telephone, all of these things can be made from hemp. Everything that you're wearing, all of your attire, um, the makeup on your face or the shaving products that you used this morning, all of that can be made from hemp. Additionally, hemp has significant impacts in cleaning the, the earth. It is a great phytoremediator. And on, on the marijuana side of things, if you are in, investing in a company that is growing outside, Please have soil tests done before you make your investment money. Hemp pulls toxins and heavy metals from the soil, and I would not want anyone in this room who's investing into a marijuana company be in the position where they're not going, they're going to lose their investment because they have, they're growing tainted cannabis. On the positive side of that, hemp was planted at Chernobyl, for example, in Russia, to pull the toxins and the radiation from the soil. And, and that hemp obviously cannot be consumed as a food item, but it can be put into inert products like hemp concrete, hemp bricks, um, and hemp fibers to be used um, in secondary applications. So basically, everything that you consume, your wear, walk through, eat, it can all be made of hemp. And it is only because we've had a prohibition against marijuana for all these years that hemp is illegal. So Treehouse is definitely looking at hemp. Thank you for that. I didn't know some of that. Um, and to hear, as an investor, what are some pieces of advice you can give female entrepreneurs seeking investment? Uh, well, it's no different, I think, for any entrepreneur. But I think um, what we often find is women just haven't had as, as much of an opportunity to pitch. And pitching, you know, it's painful. You have to go through it hundreds of times to, to get good at, it, good at it, and never to turn down an opportunity to be able to pitch. I think a lot of people have a lot of hesitation that, you know, the idea isn't, isn't complete yet, or all my design isn't done yet, but I think you learn a lot through just going through the process and the questions that people ask you. Um, and it can be, you know, I think a lot of people get turned off initially when they get really hard questions and they aren't able to necessarily answer everything, uh, but that's part of the learning process. I mean, I know, you know, I, when I worked at Privateer, the partners will tell you that they got 200 no's before they ever got a yes, and that made them better at what they were doing and, and look at where they are now. And I think every entrepreneur will tell you a similar story. Um, and, and so that part of it is like to never turn down the opportunity to be able to tell your story and refine your story. And I think we have to make sure we're not so attached to the specific idea that we have, because you'll get, you'll get feedback from people who are looking at it from a different lens and to take that into your strategy and to think of how you can make it better. Um, sometimes what we think in our head is like the perfect idea isn't as great from an investor perspective or even a consumer perspective. Like it doesn't play out that way. And so taking all that feedback in, um, you don't have to take everything, but I think that really being critical about it yourself and understanding where you can make improvements is really important. Um, and I think for women, you know, uh, if I, what I hear a lot from female entrepreneurs is that they they just if they don't come from finance, that they don't have the the lingo down and understanding, you know, how to do valuation or how to talk about it confidently. Um, and I think finding mentors or just finding people who will be, are willing to give you feedback um, and and quite frankly beat you up a little bit so you can get better at it is really important. Um, so finding you know a small 
trusted circle of advisors, man, men and women, um, to be able to give you that is critical. Thank you. And as a follow up, what would you say to investors looking at investment opportunities led by women? I mean, we've heard all the stats, so we obviously know that there is a, a benefit there. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's much different. You know, kind of similar to Tracy's point. I don't necessarily uh, define something because it's female run or not, but I certainly think that there are notable differences in how men and women pitch, which I think we've heard a lot of stories on, like. Men will say things very confidently, and, and women might kind of be a little bit more reserved on painting this massive picture because they're trying to you know, couch it a little, a little bit more and are, are more reserved in that sense. So I think that from an investment perspective, uh, you know, the, the, the strategy is the same, is we want to know why is, this, why is this a good idea? What gap is it filling? Why will it be successful? What's your competitive edge? Um, and can you articulate that? If it takes you more than a sentence or two to articulate your business, or why you're going to be successful, uh, or what gap you're filling, then, then you have a gap in your own thesis. So being able to very quickly be able to say what it is, I shouldn't have to get five minutes into a presentation to understand what the business is. Um, and that's, I mean, that's for everybody. But I think being um, for women specifically, just training a little bit more on that is always helpful. Um, as we know, the cannabis industry is the fastest growing industry in the United States. Why is it a next generational wealth opportunity? Go for it. We just have such tremendous potential. I started my first marijuana business with under $1,000. I, I had 10 lights and I, I got to the point where I grew four pounds of marijuana a, a month. And I was my only employee. Um, and I got to be a stay-at-home mom because of that. And I have to tell you, flash forward, 10 years, obviously, you cannot have the opportunity to have that business. But what I've been able to create with this plant in that short amount of time, by playing the long game, by valuing my reputation and my relationships over the profits that I make, I there's no reason why the companies and investments that I've been working with in 10 years won't be leaders internationally in both the THC and the industrial hemp space. Thank you very much. Thank Absolutely. all of you. I learned a lot.